Well, good evening, saints. Good to see you all come out this evening for our Bible study. Uh, we're going to begin, as we do each week, with prayer, followed by song of worship, and then we'll get right into our study in the book of Jeremiah. Uh, just uh, some some new updated prayer requests and praise report. First, I want to start with the praise report. Thank the Lord uh, that Sister Diane Minifield and her husband Frank have been healed and cleared from the COVID-19. So we thank the Lord for that and that they weren't uh, undergoing any particular symptoms. And so we thank God for his healing grace. Amen. And, and so as a testimony of answered prayer and that uh, Lord is moving and he hears the prayers of his people. And uh, we're encouraged by that. Amen. It could, it could have been worse. And so we thank God for his grace, his healing mercies on behalf of the Minifield family. We want to be praying for Pastor Timothy Lynham's brother-in-law who had a uh, triple bypass surgery recently, and he is undergoing some complications. And so uh, Pastor Timothy Lynham, brother-in-law, had triple bypass surgery and is, and is just undergoing some complications uh, from that procedure, asking for prayer. Uh, also want to pray for Sister Kozan uh, Taylor's sister, Joetta Davis, who has stage four cancer. So we've just been diagnosed with stage four cancer, Sister Kozan's sister, Joetta Davis. So be praying for Sister Joetta Davis. Uh, also, uh, just an update on Sister Rapkesha Brown has been moved to uh, Cardinal Hill for rehab. So that that's a blessing. So she's not in the hospital. So if you're trans, transitioning over to Cardinal Hill, that means you're going through rehab. And so we thank the Lord for uh, progress in that situation. Also tonight, I just want to pray uh, for a pastor, never met him, uh, but he's in China, Pastor Wang Yi. Uh, pastor Wang, W-A-N-G, Yi, last name Yi, Y-I, um, has been given nine years in prison for preaching the gospel. So uh, since the Lord saved him um, back in the early 2000s, uh, he was called to the ministry and been leading a church uh, for a, a while. And uh, initially a number of his members were put in prison uh, for proclaiming the gospel. Uh, his wife uh, has been released from prison as well as a number of his members. Uh, but the government just handed down recently that they will hold him in prison for nine years. So I'm just asking for prayer for him, uh, for his wife. Can you imagine, you know, your husband in prison for 10 years for standing for the Lord, uh, that God would just sustain him, uh, sustain his family, and, and that the Lord would also uh, grant favor upon him, that he might not have to stay in prison for those nine years. Uh, if not, the Lord so chooses for him to have to stay in prison, that the Lord will use this to advance his kingdom. And that a number of people will come to the saving knowledge. Uh, we, we talk about religious persecution, and um, even during this pandemic, that that word's been floating around. Uh, but we're not going through religious persecution. Uh, religious persecution is when the government tells you not to preach the gospel, uh, not when they control where you meet. Um, they can say you meet inside or outside, but you can still preach the same message. That's not religious persecution. Pastor Wang Yi is, he's going through religious persecution, and so we want to be praying uh, for him and his church and his family. Okay, that's all that I have. I always want to remind you all that there are any other prayer requests. Um, we mentioned the prayer request on Sunday. Uh, we, had, we, we also want to mention new prayer requests. I may not go through the entire list that I mentioned on Sunday, uh, but on Tuesday, oftentimes, I get new prayer requests and want to make, uh, make that known to you to pray uh, for, again, thank the Lord for the Minifields being healed. I want to pray for Pastor Timothy Lynham's brother-in-law, had triple bypass surgery, having some complications. Rakesha Brown, update on her. She's been transitioned over to Cardinal Hill for rehab. And want to pray for Pastor Wang Yi, uh, who's been in prison for nine years for standing for Christ. So we'll be praying uh, for them. Let's do that now. Yeah. Father in heaven, we come before your throne of grace this evening. Thank you, Lord, that you are our great high priest. Yes. And that, Lord God, you um, still, 
as you sit at the Father's right hand, you retain both natures as divine and human. And therefore, as your human nature, Lord, you can sympathize with us in our weaknesses. You can sympathize with us in our struggles. Uh, Lord God, you endured life on this earth, and you were a man acquainted with sorrows and with grief. And so, Lord, we know that you know how it feels. You've experienced being in a broken world when you were here incarnate. And so we ask that you would be with uh, Pastor Wayne Yi and his wife and family and church as they're undergoing persecution now in, in China. And ask that your grace will be with him and that you'll give him much favor and endurance and, and even, even grace to be delivered out and not have to be in prison for nine years, Lord. But if it's your will for him to do so, oh God, I, I pray that you would encourage his heart and, and to strengthen his wife's heart and, and the church. And that your gospel will advance and that souls will be saved as a result of this. Mm -hmm. Be with Sister Cozan Taylor's uh, sister, Joetta Davis, who just been diagnosed with stage four cancer. Oh, Father, draw her heart near to you. May her faith in you not fail. Mm -hmm. And Lord God, I pray that you will grant her favor with the doctors and the nurses, those who attend to her. Uh, Lord God, that she would get the best care possible and that you would enable her body to respond uh, to this treatment. And Lord God, we understand oftentimes, oh God, that for your own sovereign purposes, you may choose to not heal us from a disease or, or cancer in this life. You, ultimately, Lord, we know you, want, you will heal us permanently from all sin and its consequences in the resurrection. And so, Lord God, I, I just pray. I, I pray. I pray for healing. We pray for healing. But if you choose not to, Lord, I just pray that even in this, that her heart may not be troubled. Mm -hmm that you will give her a joy inexpressible and full of glory. Lord, we want to pray this often for many others, oh God, who in our congregation, who, who have uh, what seems to be a, a lifelong illness. And, and, and Lord God, they're, they're taking medications and things of that sort to cope with the pain, but it seems as if the suffering won't end as far as this life is concerned. Lord, encourage the hearts, Lord God, that they don't get uh, depressed or despairing, knowing, oh God, you're going to work all things together for their good. Mm -hmm. But Lord, we do pray for healing. We ask for your mercies to be with Sister Davis and that you would draw her closer to yourself. Lord, we thank you for uh, healing grace again upon the Minifield family. We thank you, oh God, for your mercies. They didn't have any particular uh, adverse effects from the virus. And uh, thank you, oh God, for, for looking upon them and, and healing them. It could have been worse. And we thank you, oh God, for the progress of uh, Sister Rob Keisha Brown as she's in uh, Cardinal Hill right now. Pray that you bless for her to uh, to recover. And we pray for Pastor Timothy Lynham's brother-in-law who had triple bypass surgery, Father. And you know the complications that he's enduring and ask that, Lord, uh, if it be your will to heal him, oh God. And in the meantime, Lord God, give him the grace to persevere and uh Help them, Father, uh, during this time. Father, we thank you for giving us a mind, Lord, to come in the study of your word this evening. Teach us, Holy Spirit, your word. Guide us. Sanctify us in thy truth. Thy word is truth, we pray. In Christ's name, amen. 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 Now we'll turn it over to the lovely wife, the soloist for the night, as well as our DJ, uh, Deacon Les Moore. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still. Striving seas, my comforter, my all in all. Here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, 
Welcome to Gold Flesh. Fullness of God in helpless pain. This gift of love and righteousness. Scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on the cross as Jesus died. The wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ I live. There in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain. Then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, since Christ has lost, For I am His, and He is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death, this is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever block me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of I stand, no power of hell, no scheme of man can ever block me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ, I stand. I just gotta give a shout out to my wife tonight. Now she she decided that she wanted to sing this song today and was just rehearsing it a couple of times. I was thinking she would do this next week. Uh, Me too. But she decided to do it tonight and she did a fantastic job for leading us in worship. Uh, that's one of my favorite songs and I thank the Lord for uh, giving my wife the, the strength and grace to, to lead us in worship, amen? Amen, amen. amen. Uh, before we begin our study tonight, we will be uh, looking at chapters 3 and 4 in the book of Jeremiah. Uh, that's, that's what I want to cover. However, you know, we leave it up to the Lord to lead and guide us uh, during our time tonight. Before we begin, though, I always want to open the floor for any questions. Now, I'm sure there's questions that you have. Uh, anything that may have been that we're going through currently in the Gospel of Mark, maybe some questions, needs some clarification on this past, day, past Sunday sermon or maybe something you've studied personally uh, you've had questions about. And so I want to open up the floor and, again, keep in mind the question that you might have may be a question others have had and gives opportunity for us to equip and, you know, become more, more skilled in our understanding of the scripture when it comes to various uh, subjects. So on the floor at this time, any questions? Don't be shy. Okay. No questions. Okay. All right. Now, tonight's notes will be uploaded, Lord willing, next week. Okay. And like I said before, I want us to be able to go through the passages in the book of Jeremiah, uh, sometimes taking verse by verse, sometimes taking it as a paragraph. We just kind of walk through this book together. Last week, we looked at uh, chapter two of Jeremiah as the Lord begins to take the southern kingdom of Israel, Judah, down memory lane. And he reminds them of the early years where Israel followed the Lord in the wilderness. You might remember that. The, 
the early days of his betrothals and your devotion uh, when Israel was espoused to the Lord and, and how they followed after God. They had to. God put them in the wilderness situation and they had to follow him, cloud by day, fiery by night. And through that, the Lord was using the circumstances of the wilderness to draw uh, the people of Israel to himself. And so when we understand, we talked about last week, the old covenant should be understood, not just a covenant that's based solely on law, it's a covenant that really is based on love for God that expresses itself in keeping the law. So the Lord would say in verse 13 of Jeremiah chapter 2 that Israel or Judah has committed two sins. They have first, they have uh, departed or turned away from the fountain of living waters. Second, they've hewed for themselves uh, cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. So the first sin is not having a desire or a thirst for the Lord. The second is to turn to other things that do not satisfy that are broken. And so as a result of that, uh, the Lord is calling on, on, on Judah in chapter 3 to repent. So chapter 2, uh, he, he brings out the fact, what injustice did you find in me that you went far from me? Now we get to chapter 3, and he calls on uh, the southern kingdom to repent. In fact, Chapter 3, verse 6, all the way to chapter 6, verse 30, you have God's call for repentance as he promises judgment upon Judah for violating the covenant. Okay? So in this section, chapter 3, verse 2, all the way to chapter 6, verse 30, God calls for repentance as he promises to bring judgment for violating the covenant, okay? There's a quote that someone uh, shared recently that I thought was really applicable to the section that we're in between chapter 2 and chapter 3. And this young lady said this, quote, the God of the Bible is too lovely to be abandoned for lesser pursuits. Mm. The God of the Bible is too lovely to be abandoned for lesser pursuits. That pretty much summarizes chapter two. Now we get to chapter three tonight, and I'll read uh, verses one through five of chapter three. Brother Lessa put it up on the screen, and then we'll kind of go through and explain this section. God says, if a husband divorces his wife, and she goes from him and belongs to another man. Will he still return to her? The answer is no. Uh, uh, you go back to Deuteronomy 24. Once the wife departs, the first husband can't go get his wife because she's now united to another man. Next statement or question. Will not that man be completely polluted? But you are a harlot with many lovers. Yet you turn to me, declares the Lord. So in other words, in this section here, uh, the Lord is saying to Judah, you cannot commit spiritual adultery against me and still think you get the blessings of the covenant. Okay? Judah thought that they can have a relationship with idols. They can turn towards false gods. And then whenever they felt like it, they can come back to the Lord and get the blessings. Okay? Uh, that's why he says, you are a harlot with many lovers, yet you turn to me. Uh, you turned away from me as, in a, as a divorce. You join yourself to idols, which you refer to as your lovers. And then you want to come back to me for benefits, for, for blessings. And so the Lord is, is really, again, uh, uh, indicting his people for their failure to love him. Now, application, think about this. What matters most to you will determine or dictate your motives for seeking the Lord, okay? What matters most in your heart will guide, govern, direct your reasons for seeking the Lord. What do you mean? Well, tonight on this Bible study, or, or Sunday when you watch or, or attend service, or when you get into your word and you start reading the scripture, or when you pray, 
is the motivation behind your, we can just put it on the umbrella, your religious commitments, uh, your, uh, your spiritual walk, is the motive behind it a, a devotional affection for the Lord? Or do you seek God because you want him to bless you? Okay, so what we find happening here and how the Lord is dealing with Judah in principle, by way of application for the church today, God is the same God. And therefore, in the work of redemption, God, God brings about redemption to lead to relationship. And the one thing that the Lord is confronting Judah's heart about, that we have to really be careful and, and examine our own hearts, why do we do what we do as Christians? Why do we pray? Why do we read the Bible? Why do we you know, attend like this Bible study form? Why do we come to church? Why do we, why are we, why, why do we do the things that we do? Is it because we really delight and thirst after God or because we want God to bless us? Okay. All right. Judah prayed to the Lord for blessing, but was unrepented regarding her spiritual harlotry. Okay. This leads us to the section of verse six through 11. And remember at this point, if you need, if you have any questions, feel free to chime in. Okay, so in this section, the Lord goes further with Judah in bringing out the seriousness of her sin. So for us, um, as, 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 as human beings, we really can't capture how heinous and how evil sin is uh, from a spiritual perspective. We, we really don't oftentimes think of how evil sin is before a holy God, right? Uh, we know God is angry with sin. Uh, we know that God stands against sin. We know that God is holy. He cannot sin. We know that God cannot tempt us to sin. But the Lord knows in a very tangible way how to get us to see uh, how sin is really serious and how much it offends him. And the most tangible way that God has given us, and I said this in the past, uh, the more tangible way that God has conveyed to us how much he hates sin is by death. Okay? Uh, you see birds uh, die. You see roadkill. Uh, loved ones die. And this is a tangible way to show us that sin is offensive to God, that he takes away a person's life. He removes the soul from their bodies, right? Here, in a tangible way, he wants to show Judah that turning away from him towards idols and committing spiritual adultery is used in that way because, again, God called Israel to be in a love relationship with himself. So in verse 6 through 11, um, let me read verse 6 of Jeremiah 3. Then the Lord said to me, in the days of Josiah the king, have you seen what faithless Israel did? She went up on every high hill and under every green tree, and she was a harlot there. You might remember the phrase in the book of Kings that uh, they were worshiping in the high places. This is, this is where, again, worship was to be in Jerusalem in the temple. To worship in the high places meant that they were worshiping other gods. Okay. Verse 7, and I thought after she has done all these things, she will return to me, but she did not return. And her treacherous sister Judah saw it. And I saw that for all the adulteries of faithless Israel, verse 8, I had sent her away and given her a writ of divorce, yet her treacherous sister Judah did not fear, but she went and was a harlot also. And it came about because, verse 9, of the lightness of her harlotry that she polluted the land and committed adultery with stones and trees. And yet in spite of all this, verse 10, her treacherous sister Judah did not return to me with all her heart, but rather in deception, declares the Lord. Verse 11, and the Lord said to me, faithless Israel has proved herself more righteous than treacherous Judah. Okay. Now, the language that our Lord uses here, again, we want to deal with relationship. This is marriage language here. Uh, so the Lord, he's God. God is self-sufficient. He doesn't need anything 
or anyone outside of himself. God is perfectly satisfied within himself, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Yet in this unique plan of God, in the covenant of redemption, God would say, I'm going to look upon sinners. I'm going to save sinners. I'm going to bring them into a relationship with me. Okay? There is no creature under heaven or even in heaven that has the privilege of being in a love relationship with God but the elect. Okay? Uh, animals are not given the privilege of having a love relationship with God. They still maintain sort of the, cre the, cre the creator-creature distinction. Angels that are intelligent and more intelligent than we are, who are higher in, in power and on a different level as far as their nature is concerned, yet they have no love relationship with God. These are servants of the Lord. They are ministers. They are messengers. That's what an angel means. Yet when it comes to mankind, God would choose out of the race of humanity sinners for himself and say, I'm going to bring you into something. I'm going to bring you up to a level of intimacy that I've enjoyed within myself. What a privilege, what a blessing. We call that grace. Okay. All right. God doesn't have to do that. God does not need us. So he chooses Israel for himself. You know that, right? And what he does here, remember the, the kingdom separated after Solomon's reign. Jeroboam becomes the first king of the northern kingdom and he pretty much uh, causes Israel to fall away from the Lord. Southern kingdom with Judah and Benjamin, as well as remnants from the other ten, 10 kingdoms, they stay south. And what the Lord is saying in this section, okay, the northern kingdom, they kept sinning. You got Jeroboam, you got Ahaz, and, or Ahab, all these kings, these corrupt kings. And the Lord says, okay, uh, he sends prophets like Elijah and Elisha. He sends Jonah. He sends uh, Hosea. Uh, he sends all of these. Uh, he sends. He sends. Uh, you know, all all these these prophets to the northern kingdom, calling them to repent. They never repent. Okay. In fact, he leads uh, um, uh, Hosea to write a book speaking of Israel's spiritual adultery, and he promises judgment. That judgment happened in 722 B.C. God raised up the nation of the Assyrians, okay? The, the capital of the Assyrian nation was Nineveh, where the Lord called Jonah to preach to. Well, he raised up Assyria and removed the, the ten tribes out of the northern kingdom, put in their place some Gentiles with some of the poor Jews in the northern kingdom whose capital of the northern kingdom was samaria jews got together with gentiles you have the samaritans okay god removes that that those 10 tribes okay takes them north under Assyri uh, under assyrian exile when jeremiah writes this book it's around maybe 627 bc so you have 722 627 that's almost a hundred years ago and the lord's lord is saying to judah I would have thought that what I did to the northern kingdom, you would have learned the lesson. When I removed them from this land and put them under Assyrian uh, captivity, I thought you would have learned your lesson. But here's the thing that you've done. Uh, Israel had its idolatry, but Israel was more righteous than Judah. Not, not righteous in a sense. In other words, he means they were, they were less sinful in comparison in this regard. Israel committed false worship. They ain't even trying to know me. They just committed false worship. Judah did something worse. They did the false worship and then try to pretend they still love me. That's an insult. In fact, I, I, I had skipped over uh, the verses earlier uh, in verse 4 and 5. Uh, the Lord is, is withholding uh, verse 2 and 3. He's going to withhold the blessings of the land, the rain, and all that. Uh, I'm, I'm going to remove all the covenant blessings from you. And in verse 4 and 5 of Jeremiah 3, have you not just now called to me after you removed the blessing? My father, <laughs> thou art the friend of my youth. How are you going to call God your father and you don't even follow him? Will he be angry forever? Will he be indignant to the end? Behold, 
you have spoken and done evil things and you have had your way. Here's the thing that's terrible uh, uh, about this section. If you're going to turn away from the Lord, don't, don't insult him by pretending you still love him. You know, I mean, it'd be a horrible thing in, in any marriage relationship, whether it be the husband or, or the wife, to turn away from their spouse, go and be with another person and still write you love letters. I'm talking about they, they still they still have a you have a place in their heart. It's insulting. It's offensive. And God is a jealous God. So false worship is evil. But pretending to worship the Lord while committing false worship on the side is worse in the eyes of God. Are you all following me tonight? The most striking denouncements made by our Lord against sinners is when he denounced the Pharisees, Matthew 23. And he pronounced seven woes on them of judgment. Why was the Lord so angry with the Pharisees? Here it is. Because they claim to love God and keep the law, while in reality, they love themselves and violate the law. Jer uh, Mark chapter 7. These will be in your notes next week. Mark chapter 7, verse 6 and 7. The Lord quotes from the prophet Isaiah. And you remember this, pro this statement. He says, these people, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as precepts the doctrines of men. If you were to ask the question, if you were to ask the question, where is the worst sin being committed in our world? Okay. If you were to ask the question, where is the worst sin being committed in our world? You'll really be shocked by the answer. The worst sin being committed in our world is not by pagan, unbelieving sinners, but by those who claim to know and love God, but live a scandalous life. So where's the worst sin being committed? It's not so much out there in the world as it is in the professing church. This, this is what the Lord is saying. Let, let me help you out with some scripture verses. Uh, Les likes to put some scripture verses up. Um, Hebrews chapter 10 for a moment. Let's just go to Hebrews chapter 10, uh, beginning at verse 26. Let me just prove to you that the worst sins happening in the world today are not out in the world, but amongst those who claim to know God, but live scandalous lives. Let me read this verse, and then um, I'll explain Verse 26, the Hebrew writer says, for if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, that's the gospel. So if we keep living a, a, a rebellious, sinful life after we've already claimed to have received the gospel, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. There is only one Savior. And if you sin against his Savior when you claim you loved him, but you don't follow him, there's no other, there is no other sacrifice for those sins. But a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of fire which will consume the adversaries. Anyone who set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much severer, see that there? Severe judgment. Severe judgment is to die in your sins and never receive Christ, okay? Never hear the gospel, die in your sins. Severe punishment, punishment comes when you know the gospel but you trample underfoot the Son of God and have regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he sanctified and insulted the spirit of grace. See that there? For we know him who said, vengeance mine, I will repay. And again, he will judge his people. It's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. It's an insult to God to claim that you're a follower of Jesus and live a double life. That's an insult. 
sinners like Israel, they weren't living, they weren't trying to live a double life. They were just living out there. They just went out there in the world. They weren't living out, they weren't out in the world and still calling on Jehovah. And yet we ourselves, you know, if we're not careful, we commit the worst sins more than those things that we're disgusted with the world does. The world's been given over. They're, they're, they're going to live a sinful life, but we have no excuse because we have the truth. Let me have you turn to one more verse just to prove my point. Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, verse 47 to 48. I just want to bring home this point. The Lord is saying that Israel was more righteous than Judah, not in the sense of morally righteous. They were less sinful as Judah in the sense that though they committed idolatry, Judah committed idolatry and at the same time was claiming they loved the Lord on the side. Luke chapter 12. Is a parable our Lord gives, a picture of servants that he's left, and they're to do the, the master's will until the master returns. And it says in Luke chapter 12, verse 40, what did I say? Uh, 47. And the slave who knew his master's will, follow that, and did not get ready or act in accord with his will will receive many lashes. See that there? So the connection of a stricter judgment is tied to knowing God's will. Verse 48, but the one who did not know it, did not know what, didn't know God's will, the master's will, and committed deeds worthy of a flogging will receive but few. So the question again, where is the worst sin being committed in our world? You know, um, the, the terrible shooting that took place at Fayette Mall, uh, other shootings that have taken place in our city, and, and and we say, whoa, we, we are in the end times. We, we are in the end times. You know, Paul would say the way in which to really know you're in the end times, Second Timothy chapter 3, when you know in the end times, when in the professing church, folk are living raggedy, filthy lives, when they have a form of godliness and yet deny its power. Now you know there's judgment coming. Because 1 Peter chapter 5 says judgment will begin with the household of God first. So, so the precursor to the ultimate judgment is what's going to be taking place in the church. And when God begins to kind of remove the rug and begins to allow all the stuff that's done in darkness in the professing community to be exposed, then you know, man, we're in trouble. When our witness is harmed. Um, we're in trouble. When we're saying we love God, and then over here, we compromise uh, with the world, we're in trouble. There, there's a, there's a, there's a, a hip-hop artist that was doing an interview. Uh, someone sent me the video the other day, and in the interview, he was asked questions concerning Chick-fil-A, and, um, and uh, the, the, the person who owns Chick-fil-A is a, is a professing Christian, and he's been outspoken against gay marriage. And so this Christian hip hop artist was asked questions about Chick-fil-A because this Christian hip hop artist showed up in a video with this, with the owner of Chick-fil-A and, and pretty much asked him, do you agree with his position on gay marriage? And this, this Christian hip hop artist, uh, well, I didn't know that, uh, you know, I, 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 I really can't give an answer to that. I, I just need to, Go back and understand why he holds that position. And then the guy start pressing him further. Well, if your child, your son came up to you and said that uh, I'm going to marry a man, what would you say to that? Well, I just, I don't know. I would, you know, I, I got to give you know, grace for space. I got to be able to think through uh, why he thinks this way. And basically what the guy that was interviewing this Christian hip hop artist was exposing was the fact that you, you outspoken about following Jesus but now you're afraid of being persecuted, right? You say you love the Lord, but you don't want to stand for him when it's time. Someone said that it's easy to avoid persecution. Just compromise. Just compromise. And so here, the, the, the worst sin for us, church, is to say we love the Lord and yet don't demonstrate it by our lives. Am I making sense? Are you following me?
Amen. The worst sin that is being committed in the world is not transgenderism out there and all the things that are horrible about those things. Those things are heinous. But what God de deems to be wicked is people who claim to be followers of the Lord and know his will living the opposite of the truth they claim. That, in that insults the Lord. Okay, any questions at this point? Okay, all right. Um, so we go from that dark statement back to chapter 3, verse 12 and 18. Now follow me on this. Here's the goodness of God. So I'm going to write you a certificate of divorce, but praise God, when God writes a certificate of divorce for Israel, it's not permanent. It's like he rescinds it. In verse 12 through 18 of Jeremiah chapter 3, the Lord promises Israel, the northern kingdom, that if they repent of their sins, he says, uh, uh, verse 12, um, return, faithless Israel, declares the Lord, and I will not look upon you in anger, for I am gracious, declares the Lord. I will not be angry forever. This is now, I hope you understand, a new and better under uh, a better comp uh, a better way to comprehend grace grace is this you've offended me and you deserve to be punished for it but i'm going to forgive you wow oftentimes we think of grace as far as the consequences of sins that we've committed and god removes those consequences from us but here grace is seen as you're in a relationship with me and you personally offended me. You insulted me. You are going after these idols. And then you only come back to me when you want a blessing. And I'm your husband. And I view this relationship as you're my wife. And you do these things bold face. But if you return to me, if you turn and repent, I'll be gracious to you. That means I will choose to not be angry with you no more. I will choose not to bring forth justice and wrath upon you and give you what you deserve for offending me personally. I'll be gracious. That's, that is beautiful. I mean, a God is not obligated to be gracious to us and the sins that we've committed are personal offenses against him. And he says, I'll forgive you for it. If you return to me. Okay, going back to the text, turn to the verse here. Um, so he says, where are we at? Okay, uh, verse 13, 13, only acknowledge your iniquity that you've transgressed against the Lord your God and have scattered your favors to the strangers under every green tree. And you have not obeyed my voice, declares the Lord. Return, O faithless sons, declares the Lord. See how it changes up from wife, now it's children. For I am a master to you. I will take you from a city and two from a family. I will bring you to Zion. And you know, it is the verse that, was quoted uh, during my candidating process. You all quoted this verse, Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 15. Then I will give you shepherds after my own heart and will feed, who will feed you on knowledge and understanding. Now we get the context. The Lord says, I, I send you out. The, I've already sent you. This Israel is already in Assyrian captivity. He says, if you, were, if you repent, your judgment won't be permanent. I'll bring you back to the land. And here are the promise. Here are the blessings that will come. And let me just summarize these blessings. Um, the first blessing is, I will guide you by sending shepherds after my own heart. I won't leave you to yourself. You know, you know. One of the things that was a struggle for me when the Lord saved me was that I had no direction once I became a Christian. I didn't know how to live the Christian life. You know, and. Part of the things that we often find in Christianity, just speaking generally, um, and I, you know, even even amongst pastors, when pastors are trying to figure out ministry, is oftentimes um, we, we can speak down to people, and, and and you're not doing this right, and this is what you need to do. We or we 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 throw things at people, and we don't sit back and say, hey, this person may not even know. <laughs> uh, how to do this. They need someone to come alongside. And, and the Lord says, Israel, you have sinned against me so long. You don't even know. You don't even know direction. You have no sense of direction no more. I'm going to give you shepherds after my own heart. 
You have prophets, false prophets, who lead you away from me. I'm going to make sure I give you shepherds who know me, and 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 I will make sure I keep you. I, 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 you won't you won't you won't you won't have to be afraid. You know you, you know um, if, if you come out of a, a, a past of certain sinful addictions, and you're afraid, like I don't ever want to return back to that lifestyle. One pastor quoted on social media earlier today that those who come out of a pornographic lifestyle, uh, he says, those I've counseled never tell me they want to go back into that lifestyle. They're, they're suffering the consequences of it. And so here, Israel is, if they return to the Lord and they're genuine about it, that means they don't want to return back to that life. They, they, they not only committed the sins, but they suffered the consequences for those sins, and it's, just, it's distasteful to them. But now they come back, how do I get my life right? God says, I'll do it. I'll, I'll do it for you. I'm going to send you some shepherds. And they, they have a love for me, and they'll guide you. That's the first blessing. Second blessing uh, given to you uh, in verse 16 and it shall be in those days, where is it at? Okay, in those days when you are multiplied and increase in land, declares the Lord, they will no longer say, uh, talk about the Ark of the Covenant. They won't come to their mind or miss it. So here, when the Lord sent them into Assyrian captivity, the northern kingdom depleted because some were killed by the sword, some were killed by famine, some were killed by pestilence. Okay, and this was what the Lord promised he would bring upon them. He said, I'm going to, I'm going to build you back up again. And when you come back, you're going to be looking for the, you're going to be looking for that, which that's a symbol of my presence. You're going to be looking for the Ark of the Covenant. Now, I need, y'all need to follow me on this, okay? Because uh, God is transitioning here for us. And he's saying something that's future. He's, he's prophesying. You're not going to look for the Ark of the Covenant. Um, and, and, and not come to your mind, nor shall you remember it nor shall they miss it, nor shall it be made again. Which means that, that when the southern kingdom goes into exile, uh, and there's just, there's a back and forth, we don't know where the Ark of the Covenant went, whether Nebuchadnezzar took it in Babylonian captivity, or whether uh, Shishak, uh, the pharaoh of Egypt, came and took the Ark. Okay, some even believe that Jeremiah knew where the ark was, okay? But here the Lord is speaking. In the future, Israel, you'll return to me. I'll, I'll raise up shepherds, and you're not going to look for the ark of the covenant. Notice verse 17. Here's the key. At that time, they shall call Jerusalem, follow this, the throne of the Lord. And all the nations will gather to it, to Jerusalem, for the name of the Lord, nor shall they walk any more after the stubbornness of their evil heart. Let me read verse 18. In those days, the house of Judah will walk with the house of Israel. God's going to bring the nations back together, and they will come together from the land of, of the north to the land, to the land, that's the land of Canaan, that I gave their fathers as an inheritance. The question is, when will this happen? Okay, so right here in Jeremiah, God's indicting both Israel and Judah. And he's saying, Israel, if you return to me, I'll bring you back in the land. I'll have shepherds shepherd you. You won't be looking for the Ark of the Covenant. Here's something greater than the Ark of the Covenant. The Lord himself will be in Jerusalem. That's where he sets up his throne. So verse, you can write this in your Bibles if you, if you do that. Verse 17 and 18 is speaking of the millennial kingdom. When Jesus Christ comes back. Okay, so here's the thing that we're learning here. So when we talk about eschatology, eschatology is the study of end times. Okay, when will Israel be saved and return to the Lord? That's, that's Romans 11, verse 25 on. Paul is saying that right now, in this time that we're in, the church age, Jesus is building his church. When his church is complete, when the body of Christ is, is formed when the last person that God has elected to be a part of the body of Christ, then the church will be raptured. That's 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 and 18. We should be caught up. Dead in Christ shall rise. Those who are alive and remain shall be caught up. 
Then Paul says the day of the Lord begins. We call that the tribulation period. And during that time, according to Revelation 7, 1 through 8, according to Revelation chapter 12, God will save Israel during the tribulation period. So here in the midst of this, this prophetic book and, and, and in the midst of sin, God gives hope. God gives hope. Um, you know, this is something that we have to encourage ourselves, I would even say preach to ourselves, uh, that there are moments where we get discouraged about sins in our own life. We get discouraged, and we'll see this in chapter 4, like Jeremiah, we get discouraged when we see in our nation. I mean, as the Lord is saying this, uh, I'm going to bring judgment upon you. Uh, Jeremiah cries out in anguish, you know. And yet in the midst of this, God gives us hope. That means that these seasons of darkness, the pandemics, and what we see taking place in the nation, that the, the unrest, the civil unrest, the polarization, the separation, the clashing that we see, and, and, and it's unsettling. And the Bible says we have to go this route. And I'm not saying that America is in Bible prophecy. We're not. Uh, American as a nation is considered pagan in the eyes of God. Uh, the only thing that Christ is building is not a nation. He's building a church. Okay? And he's Satan from every nation, tribe, and tongue to comprise his church. But the things that we see in this world, the Lord is saying someday soon, all this is going to be removed. Sin the curse and death will be removed and Christ will reign. Let me just speak on a personal level. Um, I was thinking the other day um, about my own death. And uh, my wife and I were talking about uh, Pilgrim's Progress this morning. She's listening to the audio of Pilgrim's Progress and the last scene in Pilgrim's Progress. Now, Pilgrim Progress, written by a man named John Bunyan, and he was placed in prison for preaching the gospel, Bedford Jail. And while he is, it was in prison, he wrote uh, a story, an allegory of the Christian life. And this man named Christian who makes his journey from the city of destruction to the celestial city of heaven, and how God saved him. And, and, and it comes to the end of Christian's life. He has to go through the Jordan River. He has to go through the waters and die. And how... Christian and hopeful are going through the waters about to die. And, and he was picturing how you come to the end of your life and you may not have your mind. You, you know, you may forget things and you get discouraged. Fear begins to come upon you. And, and my wife was kind of sharing with me like how hopeful and, and Christian are going under the waters and hopeful just gets, dis I mean, Christian gets discouraged and I'm not going to make it. And hopeful say, I see the Lord. He's on, he's on the other side. And well, he's standing there for you. He's not standing there for me. And, and, and the waters become shallow or deep depending upon where your mindset is. And the point of the story is that God's going to get you through. You're going to make it over. And all of us, and I think for us as Christians, we don't talk much about death for ourselves. And yet here it is. This is just, uh, as Spurgeon would say, death is just the door to the blessings of being in the presence of the Lord. But I prayed for myself, and I said, Lord, whatever my time is to die, whether it be that it's instantaneous death or gradually getting a, a virus or getting a, a, a cancer and, and I'm realizing I'm declining or, or just by aging, Lord, give me, a, give me the ability by your spirit to have joy at the thought I'm about to see my Savior. May people look at me. And, 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 and not see a person who's afraid. May they see a person who's at peace. I want to be like the Apostle Paul, for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. Um, that, that's the hope, the ultimate hope that we have. Um, there, there is no hope in this world. And this is why Paul is saying in, in, in Philippians 3.21, our citizenship is in heaven for which we eagerly wait for a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know how many cycles Israel 
the northern kingdom went through with kings, that each king that comes up, the Lord sends a prophet, hey, I give you an opportunity. If you follow me, if you repent, I'll bless your reign. They didn't do it. They didn't do it. They didn't do it. Do you know how many kings, 20 in the southern kingdom, only eight of the 20 were righteous. Only four out of the eight brought reform. And yet it still did not keep them from the judgment that God was bringing upon that nation. No matter what your position is in this political season, who you think was best for America, guess what? It's not going to be enough to keep the wrath of God from coming. It's already prophesied in the word. God's about to bring wrath. And the only way to escape the wrath of God is not by a politician, but by faith in Jesus Christ. I better get a witness to that. Amen. The only thing we're doing with politicians is trying to make sure we maintain our level of comfortability. But ultimately, the wrath of God is going to come. If it came and it was upon Josiah's reign, and he was the last and final most righteous, God says, no, Israel, Judah has sinned too far. Judgment is coming. This is where we get to chapter four. Any questions at this point? We got four minutes left. I don't know if I can handle breaking down all this uh, in, four, in, in four minutes. I won't try it. I'm going to summarize it. And then what we're going to do, we're going to go come back next week and break this, this down. Because a lot of what the Lord is saying to the southern kingdom is applicable for us today. But the basic bottom line, let me read verse 1. Because really the Lord is not done with speaking of Israel. If you will return, O Israel, declares the Lord. Then you shall you should return to me, and if you will put away your detestable things from my presence and will not waver. Uh, and then verse two, and you will swear as the Lord lives in truth and justice and righteousness, then the nations will bless themselves in him, and in him they will glory. Here's the point. God is calling Israel to repent, but they can't on their own. What God is calling for them to do, only he's the only one that can do it for them. And he's saying it's going to happen in the future. I'm going to, I'm going to send forth the spirit of grace in the words of Zechariah. He's going to regenerate your heart. And when Jesus Christ comes back, you're going to mourn for, that, for, for your Messiah whom you pierced as you mourn for, my, for an only son. Israel will return to me. They're going to return to me, notice this, in truth and justice and righteousness. Part of Israel's disobedience was not just the sin of idolatry. It was also the sin of mistreating the neighbors. And the Lord's going to say the same thing to Judah. You sinned against me on a vertical level with idolatry. You sinned against me on a horizontal level by how you mistreated one another. And when I redeem you, you won't have selective morality. You're not going to pick and choose what's important. What's in truth, justice, and righteousness. That's what regeneration will do. That you see sin, you see righteousness as being comprehensive, as love of God and love of neighbor, from the womb to the tomb. And he says, that's what you're going to do. I'm going to redeem you that way. That speaks to us, church. You know, when the Lord saves us, he wants us to have a comprehensive view when it comes to righteousness and justice and truth. He doesn't want us in the sin of partiality. Uh, he doesn't want us to be selective when it comes to morality. Uh, he doesn't want us to have situational ethics. The Lord is offended when we are sinning vertically, when our hearts are not focused on him and horizontally when we're not loving our neighbors as ourselves. And so uh, this is something for us to just continue to think through, pray about. Uh, this is the area of our sanctification. Do we love God with our heart, mind, soul, and strength? And, do our, and, and, and is that love for God manifested in how we treat one another? Now, in this season, when the world is, is divided, the church needs to be the light that shows that we're together. That comes by how do how do we how do we draw near 
to, or how do we preserve the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace? How do we maintain, as I've been saying in our four point prayer emphasis, how do we maintain unification in the church, particularly in a season, and I mentioned this on Sunday, where all of us, number of us are, have different political positions. First of all, we don't question someone's salvation based on political positions because we have no authority. Salvation is based on faith alone and Christ alone. We can agree uh, to disagree and say, hey, I, I just think you're wrong for how you vote on that or your opinion on that issue, but we are in no position to say someone's a Christian, not a Christian. But how do we maintain unity in, in such a time like this? We gotta saturate our hearts and mind in the word. We gotta pray for unity. Uh, we gotta be in fellowship and community. And we gotta learn how to show love and generosity towards one another. I mean, if the Lord can be gracious to Israel in light of everything the Lord that Israel did to the Lord, we have no excuse for being gracious and loving towards one another. Because, because when it comes to offending one another, um, your offense against me and my offense against you is small in comparison to our sins against the Lord. And he calls on us to, to walk in love towards one another. I hope that makes sense. Um, next week, Lord, we'll, 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 we'll look at verse 3 to the end of chapter 4. But I'm thankful we made it uh, through chapter 3 this evening. Any questions before I conclude? Okay. Uh, we will have, Lord willing, these notes up for you next week. And it's important, too, because there is a portion of the notes in chapter 4 that I want Brother Les to put up on the screen uh, for us to look together. Asking for prayer for Keon. He'll be having surgery next Tuesday. So we're going to be praying for little Keon. He'll have surgery on next Tuesday. Okay. And, uh, is, okay. All right. Um, before we close, I want to make some announcements before we conclude. A reminder, we have our better class this coming Saturday from 8 in the morning to 9.30. And uh, those who have never been a part of the better, better class, brothers um, being equipped uh, uh, to teach effectively, uh, equipped in theology to teach effectively and reproduce. We have that class from 8 to eight to 9.30, and I'll have notes for that um, on our website sometime soon this week or towards the end. And uh, you can come and access our better class through our church website. Also, after that uh, class at 10 o'clock, we'll have our financial literacy uh, class uh, access through Zoom through our church website as well. So please be aware of that. Thank the Lord for Sister Beverly Bowens uh, leading us in that. Very important class on financial stewardship. Also, uh, Friday, uh, Sister Donna Owens made the announcement or gave me the announcement to make to you all. Friday at 1 in the afternoon, there will be a drive-by birthday parade for Sister Rosetta Dawson. So please contact the Owens for information as far as the address of Sister Rosetta Dawson. She is turning, she's in her 90s. And so I want to show some love to her and her family if you're able and available this coming Friday, 1 in the afternoon. For that, please contact Sister Donna Owens. Also, don't forget our online giving, and you can access you can access access <laughs> you can give your offer through our church website. Um, you know, you bring down that icon and and select where you like your offering to go towards. So, want to be faithful. We have our Tuesday offering, of course, it goes towards our chapel. We call it the Gideon. Uh, offering, so we want to maintain. Uh, just want to be faithful and consistent in that. However, the Lord, however the Lord leads, uh, please, please uh, seek to be faithful in your giving. That is all that I have for us for tonight. Um, there is no other questions or comments. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank we thank you for our time tonight and sobered by your word and and how Lord God you hate hypocrisy. You hate when we say things of honor to you with our lips, but our hearts are far from you. Oh, Father, um, ask you to forgive us and that you would 
turn our hearts away from apathy and indifference and hypocrisy towards you, that you would, Holy Spirit, incline our hearts with a renewed softening to love you with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And in light of how much you loved us, Lord Jesus, I pray, oh God, that that would be uh, the basis upon which we love one another as sacrificially as you loved us. Lord, cleanse our hearts and show us our sin and cause us to be broken over it. Help us to be faithful towards you. Thank you for the hope that you gave Israel and Judah, that even despite the chastening and the judgment that they would undergo, you would bring them back. And there's a hope for us, Lord God, even in this season, that even as bad as things are, Lord, you promised us that you're going to work all things together for our good. You told us, oh God, that you will supply all of our needs according to your riches and glory. You told us that you'll never leave us nor forsake us. You told us, oh God, to, that, that one day Christ will come back and, and he will establish everlasting righteousness. And we'll never have a, a despairing day again. We'll never have a sorrowful day again. We'll never have a, a vexing day again. We'll never have fear in our hearts. We'll never be troubled but joy everlasting. Lord, help us to keep our minds stayed on you that we may be kept in perfect peace for our minds stayed on thee. Be with little Keon, oh God, as he prepares for surgery on next week. Be with him. Give him your peace and give Kiara your peace and Antonio your peace that surpasses all comprehension. Bless his procedure to go well. Oh God, bring him through this. Be with Sister Kozan sister, Joetta Davis, May your healing mercies be upon her, Pastor Timothy Lynham's brother-in-law, your healings upon him. Lord, be with Rakisha Brown uh, as she's recuperating in Cardinal Hill. And Lord, thank you once again for your mercies and healing, Sister Diane and Frank Minifield. Lord, thank you for your grace. Guide us, O oh God, we pray. Um, as we come to another end of a day, we thank you for another undeserved day. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Love you, Main Street. <laughs>